Well, I've uh, spent most of my career in uh, uh, technology. My, my, the bulk of my uh, career was based in uh, was hospital information systems on a large scale. I was one of the the lead software architects for the the, the VA hospital the decentralized hospital information system DHCP and the Department of Defense Composite Healthcare System CHCS. So those are both. Uh, very large-scale hospital architectures, or, uh, software architectures, and uh, so my role was uh, mostly working with the kernel software and the the, the early stages of the of the system, and watching very simple ideas blossom into very large-scale systems. Okay. We're asking people about what they think is going to happen in the future. Just in general, what what do you see? Well. Um, <clears throat> I guess it's Alan Kay, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So uh, I guess my, my, uh, my thoughts are to, uh, to try to invent things. My particular passion is using technology to make the world a better place. And uh, I've kind of went through a life change experience when I turned 50 and uh, uh, decided to get into philanthropic and humanitarian applications of, of technology. So that's been my focus. So I, I, rather than calling it philanthropy, which has the misinterpretation of rich people writing checks to poor people, philanthropy actually means love of humanity in uh, the technical terms, I guess. Um, I, I call it better world activities. How do you make the world a better place? Which can be business opportunities, fair trade opportunities. It can be uh, microdevelopment loans to give women loans to buy a sewing machine. Can be cash donations, but it, there can be many, many different patterns of, of uplift. I call them, uh, and only a small portion of that is actually a monetary gift. So I've been looking at ways of using the uh, the technology and what we're learning from networks and connectivity for uh, better world activities. And uh, so what I see happening is that we learn uh, more and more how to how to make the world a better place through the network effect. And things like a Google or an eBay or an Amazon that suddenly went from very small-scale operations to huge uh, uh, global impact. Uh, same thing could happen with uh, some better world activities. That that something out there that we might not see as a, a very big activity today um, could cascade and become you know the the next big thing. Uh, but it be focusing on uh, humanitarian uplift, if you will. Best case scenario, what do you what do you see being created that's going to make the world better? Well, I have a thing called very large scale uplift, uh, VLSU, kind of modeled after VLSI, very large scale integration, and it's based on this notion of uh, I think they called it fine grain uh, distributed systems yesterday of of having a lot of very small scale uh, better world opportunities, but used by a very large number of people. So we have six billion people in the world, all of whom could be doing something to make the world a better place, and all of whom would benefit from having done that. So there's this a virtuous circle <laughs> potential of, of enormous magnitude if you could figure out how to do that. And so the, uh, the, the conditions I see for that are to have uh, more and more people involved in, in you know, lower threshold scale of activity. So you don't, the smaller thing you can do to have greater connectivity, greater uh, impact on the world, scaled up to more and more people. Uh, so you have this multiplicative effect and you have an exponential growth of, of good things. So that's the, the VLSU model. Um, it's not too far removed from what Google and eBay are doing today. Uh, eBay is organized around the notion of an auction and a reputation system, 150 million people or something like that in the space. And, uh, but the auction is the, the condensing point, if you will, of the activity. In a, a, a better world cascading effect, it would be these better world opportunities. There's, there's this thing, we want to send blankets to the hurricane victims or something like that. So you have, instead of an auction, you have, uh, I'll call it a, a transformation as an as a abstract term. But a transformation is a fairly, it's a longer term process that has a goal and, a, and a, maybe it might not reversible, be reversible. You teach somebody to read and you can't un, undo the reading or literacy. So the people who get involved in this better world opportunity or activity would 
would do the, the project if they complete it, if the people do what they say they're going to do. When they start out, they get a reputation like you get on eBay. And you can have this network effect based on reputation and trust, um, based on a whole lot of little things happening around the world. And then you take a, a, the Google side of this would be to discover what's working and what are the patterns of uplift, what is working in the world, how do you, f <clears throat> how do you find these things, and then how do you do more of it. So if you have this long tail of the distribution and the power law distribution, I'm presuming we're, the audience can understand this without explaining it. So it's a power law distribution where you have a long tail of uh, of a lot of random chaotic activities, supposedly, of people just trying things and acting according to their uh, instincts, if you will. And then you find the things that are a little bit more uplifting than the others, that the things that are working out there, you discover that through the reputation system, through people intentionally paying attention to something. So to pay attention is one of the better world tools that I'm looking at. So it'd be kind of a, a tagging mechanism, or a, I call them uplift magnets in my uh, prototypical architecture I'm thinking about here. But people can pay attention to these things, which elevates them out of the chaotic Brownian motion out there, and kind of ratchets them, up, ratchets them up a little bit higher. And in physics, it's called a Brownian ratchet motor. And you have just a slight differential resistance to one direction over the other. So if you have just the slightest discriminator that says this is a better idea than, than that, or this better world thing is a little bit better, it ratchets up. So that kind of elevates it from the Brownian motion chaotic level to a, 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 another level of, of attention, which might be enough to actually cascade this good idea into better things. Uh, philanthropy groups, or people who have the resources, could then go into what I call the amplification stage of finding that opportunity and then amplifying it through resources. So, geez, this is a good idea, they need a million dollars, bam, it's a better idea. Or if it doesn't work, then it doesn't do it. So that was this process of cascading. So you go from the, the huge number of small-scale activities to the slightly ratcheted up ones to the amplified thing to something that's, that's very large and scaled. And this can happen a whole lot faster than your traditional hierarchical development methodologies. And it also requires intense feedback of knowing what's working. And in fact, the feedback may be more important than the, 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 the activity which was one of the lessons I learned yesterday at the sessions about the in intense degree of feedback that Google uses for its uh, learning, spell checkers being done by user feedback rather than dictionaries, uh, language translation done through tra uh, statistical methods. So the, the idea of having a very intense feedback model of having this, this probably reputation-based model of saying, this was a good idea, people thought this was a good idea, and scale it up there. So. Am I answering your question? <laughs> um, what needs to happen to, to make a, a process like you described happen? Well, I, I, was, I was active with um, Tim Berners-Lee in the early days of the web. I went to the first W3C consortium and spent a lot of time talking to Tim and uh, what he was doing and his notions of decentralization and scale and um, learned a lot from what he did there. And in his book, he has a quote I can't say quite literally, but he said something, people don't recognize how simple the web was when it started. The web was HTTP uh, URLs or URIs and HTML and nothing more. So he didn't go to a blue ribbon panel and say, how should we organize the web? He didn't ask UN for permission to create the World Wide Web. He just created these very simple initial conditions that uh, fueled themselves uh, to become the web. He didn't try to build a search engine or the uh, a Dewey Decimal System, so you know, physics was websites 1 to 100 and chemistry 200 to 300, just created this chaotic mess of URLs and search engines emerged and they got better over time and today we have Google, Next, tomorrow we might have something else. But uh, what he did, is I call it the coffee cup diagram, he started out with these simple initial conditions and then he put it within the constraint of internet product protocol IP. So he could have gone to AOL or CompuServe or Prodigy and saying, hey, could I have some space on your computers to do my Tim's web? But no, he went to the IP world and the open internet protocol world. But the, the closure that he imposed on the web by making it IP dependent is what made it open. So good fences make good neighbors type of thing. So the constraints you put on your initial conditions are critical to the, the 
what I'll call an autocatalytic effect from those initial conditions. So that, I think it turns out it was a very wise thing to do is use IP. And in terms of an evolutionary process of starting very simply and letting it grow over time, uh, consumer attention was the fitness function. So sites that people paid attention to grew and thrived on, on the web. So that's kind of my meta model of the web. I call this an autocatalytic space. And it, this autocatalytic space has a property as you add stuff to it, it, it gets bigger. So entropic space is uh, what we normally see at a shopping center. So if Barnes & Noble comes in and uses up a, a shopping center space, it goes away. You know, you can't use it for a Starbucks. Amazon comes on the web and made the web bigger. Uh, it didn't use up the web. It did, the, there was no uh, loss of, of capacity, in fact, make it bigger. So the sense of people piling on to the web to make it bigger, uh, which the network effect and all this other stuff that we're looking here at this Accelerating Change Conference, very, very potent stuff. In philanthropy, humanitarian activities, there's this kind of a mindset that we have too many problems and not enough money. So what are our worst problems? How much money do we have? We can only fund the top 10, number 11 through 500 are, are out, out to lunch. The autocatalytic model says is that we have a virtuous circle that the more you do good things, the more good things will happen. And sometimes it takes money, sometimes it doesn't. But I'm not starting from the standpoint of we don't have enough money. I'm saying we don't have enough connectivity, we don't have enough understanding, we don't have enough um, um, meaningfulness in what we're doing. And if you look at what happened just recently in uh, Hurricane Katrina, uh, there was probably about 60 sites that tried to do people finders uh, for, for locating families. So very, very good intention people wanted to do something, but we ended up with 60 incompatible sites that didn't, didn't connect in any way. Uh, the Red Cross website for doing that was, I, I think, really quite poor and um, uh, amateur production. So the technology the best technology came from those, one of those smaller sites, but the connectivity wasn't there. So creating a space within which the good things can, can exist and uh, cooperate and connect with, I think is, is critical. So the, the meta model that Tim used on creating the web, I think is what needs to be done for a better world, uh, an autocatalytic space, figuring out what's working, doing more of it, getting more people in there. Uh, more things to make the world a better place don't have to displace other things to make the world a better place. In fact, they, they feed back in this, this virtuous circle. The traditional model, uh, I've been very influenced by David Cooperwriter and his world of uh, appreciative inquiry and Martin Seligman and positive psychology. And also what I call the positive flip of looking at what's working and how do you do more of it. And I use the metaphor of toasters and cats for this. The, the, the toaster is a, uh, is a system where the whole toaster is equal to the sum of the parts of the toaster. You fix what's wrong with the toaster and you make the toaster whole again. A cat is a different level of complexity. If you have a dissected cat, it's a fundamentally different thing than a live cat. You can't fix what's wrong with a dead cat to make it a whole cat anymore. Uh, the cat is also resilient. If the, if the toaster loses its cord, it's no longer a functioning toaster. If a cat loses its tail, it's still a cat. It can lose an eye, a paw, a ear, or whatever. So cats have this resiliency and adaptability to them. So understanding the, the whole cat and how it lives and thrives and reproduces and behaves is a fundamentally different knowledge than understanding the dead cat and how it's dissected. So when we have systems with emergent properties that uh, the, you, you can't get to the, the, the whole from the sum of the parts anymore. So the, the, my theory here is that we have an increasingly cat-like problems that we're facing in the world, but we're stuck with toaster-like metrics. So we have a very linear accounting system. So we, we think of, of accounting problems in transactional analysis. So understanding and having a language to talk about what's working, uh, I call it positive discourse. Uh, Martin Seligman has been a pioneer in that in psych, uh, psychology, and he's got a book called Character, Strengths, and Virtues instead of uh, DSM, the Diagnostic Standards Manual. Uh, medicine in general has 1.2 million terms for how to be sick. Uh, UMLS, it's called, uh, has virtually nothing to talk about how to be well or healthy or, or thrive. So we don't have a way of talking about human resilience in the same sense we have a way of talking about all the diseases. So in our genomic and protonomic research, we're looking for what's wrong and how to fix it. We're not looking for the resilience gene. 
and people who find the resilience gene uh, aren't going to make money having a drug for, well, maybe they, maybe they are, but the, we have this split in our ways of knowing, which I call malnosis and beninosis. Well, malnosis is a way of knowing by what's wrong, and beninosis is a way of knowing what's positive and working. So beninosis is the, uh, the live cat knowledge, and malnosis is the dead cat knowledge. And so the overwhelming trend is to, when we move from toasters to cat-like thinking, is to carry through the malnostic understanding. How does the cat fail? How do we fix it? And so we have this, this model in the world of, uh, you know, we can make the world a better place by fixing all of its problems. So what are its problems? Let's list them all and, and pay for them all. Uh, that, to me, is um, a, a vicious circle. In fractal theory, they call it the devil's staircase. The, uh, it's, a, it's a curve that the more you look at it, the more steps you have in it. Um, the, the flip side of it, which comes out of uh, this, this positive discourse, is what's working, how do we do more of it? That's not denying that there's problems, but is saying that you can work with things from a sense of resiliency. So for Katrina, you, the hurricane, you'd say, well, what are the, what's the community resiliency that we can use to rebuild with? Uh, rather than what are the victims, how much does it cost, and why isn't Washington sending them more money? Now, obviously we need to spend money, but it, it, if you do it from a, a point of resiliency of, of what's working, how to do more of it, it's a fundamentally different problem than, than fixing all the problems. So fixing all the problems in Katrina isn't going to make New Orleans a better place. It's, uh, that's, that's one of the lessons here. So the, starting off with this form of discourse that we we're f systematically looking for what's working and how to do more of it, I think is a very cr critical point of it. Creating an autocatalytic space, the, the Amazon approach versus the shopping center approach, so that the more people who pile on, the more, more it happens, the way it goes. So the, the, the space fuels itself, good things trigger more good things, and more people discover uh, these things are happening, and it, it just uh, feeds on itself in the same way as the web took off with very little initial conditions. So I, uh, I can't say I have the specific uh, ideas there. I'm, I'm still thinking this all through, and it's one of the reasons I'm here at this conference. But I think some of the this things that I've discovered really are uh, reputation and trust are a key part of this space, that the, uh, the ability to trust someone at the other end of a, of a network uh, according to uh, some community standards that if I send these books to this school in Jamaica that they'll really get there and it's not a ripoff or it's not a Viagra salesman coming at me. So trust is one of the what I'll call intrinsics of the space. <coughs> identity is another one of knowing who you're doing with and having a persistent identity so that across multiple transactions or transformations or activities you know this really is Juan Gonzalez in Guatemala. Um, so identity is another uh, part of it. And if you, fa if you take Tim's original uh, model for the web, URLs was identity, HTTP was connectivity, and HTML was this relationship or, or formatting. So identity, connectivity, and relationship is what you could call his initial conditions. So identity is there. There's movements there. Um, identity Commons was, was here at this group. Uh, obviously, there's no end of identity schemes out there. Connectivity, the web is certainly, and cell phones and SMS and, you know, there's, connectivity is there, but it's, it's a little too open. It doesn't have the constraints that Tim used for IP on, on, on the web. So it's, the Katrina activities were, were so open that they didn't have the sense of closure to, to be able to find your, your neighbors. So you get this one by having a closed space or a walled garden that you work within, or you could have a Google-like referential model that would find these things through Google Magic, whatever they're using. So you could, you could tag things, you could have some set of conventions. And I think that um, this, the, the tagging phenomena, folksonomy, the, the, uh, the kind of the adaptive ontologies that I see coming there, are, are th that's primordial soup for this. I don't think we have the solution for it out of it yet. Then the relationship model of how do you connect all these things and this, this sense of transformation of, of, of figuring out what's working and doing more. So it's kind of the verb in the language, if you will. Um, I haven't figured that out yet either. I've, I've played with 
a thing called uh, philanthropic markup language to you know, tagging uh, that kind of stuff. It doesn't quite work for me right now. I'm, it's, I'm, it's a work in progress. I'm happy to get other people that can uh, think these things through with me. The constraints on it, um, the, the IP constraint on this better world space or autocatalytic space, um, is another issue of uh, legality, uh, the, the whole ethics on the internet type of stuff. Um, Homeland Security has all kinds of interesting new twists on what you can do to help the world now, and you don't want to help those terrorists, which obviously you don't, but uh, the, the, the interpretation of that can be pretty draconian sometimes. And uh, so just setting up a system to send money around the world for philanthropic causes is a little more complicated due to that. The fitness function is another thing, and that's a topic that I've seen here is People talk about good and bad a lot. This is a good network, this is a bad future, whatever. Uh, it seems to me, well, first of all, good and evil have been discussed for quite a few millennia right now. But in terms of the singularity or the accelerating change model, our, our ethics um, of just what is good um, changes. Uh, uh, and uh, there's some ethical issues there that I haven't resolved. Um, the one of my reactions to this this particular group and its artificial intelligence orientation is uh, it's a little bit focused on that and the the intrinsic or the the driving force behind the singularity is going to be artificial intelligence. I'm not convinced that that's really the the true thing. If you go back and look at uh, any of the historical or classical or religious writings, uh, love is a far more powerful. Uh, intrinsic, I think, than artificial intelligence. Uh, and so I, I think uh, there may be other human virtues that would drive the singularity rather than uh, the, the technological focus that I see here. Uh, and that's not to say that they don't both exist. But So uh, basically the fitness function in this autocatalytic space, the evolutionary space, would be the human virtues. And it, you go back all the way to Aristotle and what he called the good life or eudaimia. Uh, and it's not really rocket science. I think the, the love, peace, joy, happiness, how you feel when you look at a baby who's got a clean diaper or, or, and it's not going to be on a plane with you, um, that emotional response of, of, uh, of you know, looking at your species as your younger generation and that, that sense of, uh, I call it the baby in room phenomenon. If we had a room full of people and a, a baby walked in or somebody walked in with a baby, uh, People's voices would go up. They, you know, want to chuck the baby. You, know, you want to have eye contact with the baby. Those emotions that are aroused around a baby, I think, are some of the more primordial emotional experiences that would be the driving force. I think behind uh, uh, the, the fitness function of the, of, the, of, of a, a radical change or transformation in society. So that whole idea is wrapping up into very large-scale uplift and VLSU. Uh, it's still a, a thought experiment. Um, I'm working with the Omidyar network. Uh, uh, Pierre Omidyar started eBay and is trying to take the community aspects of eBay into humanitarian activities. I worked with uh, Stanford's Digital Vision program uh, as a fellow here a couple of years ago, and um, specifically to, to look at better world activities and started a group called Giving Space. Um, yeah, it's kind of a think tank for workshops for these things. Um, one other aspect of all this, and looking at how the web started out, I, I worked with John Postel in my early days in the VA designing the mail system, and John, I think, is one of the underappreciated visionaries behind the internet. He's passed away a few years ago, but uh, he really had the vision, I think, for a lot of the protocols and the, 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 the foundations behind the internet that allowed the network effect to take place. And I think we're seeing the, the same situation um, with the end-to-end -end, uh, principle on the internet of uh, through um, the um, uh, Ma Bell when he was designing the network had the smart center of the network that the you go to Ma Bell and, and it'll take care of your message. And so smart center dumb peripheral. So you had a, a touch tone phone and all the smarts were in the, in, uh, in the network. Uh, John Postel and others in the end in 
principle. I'm, I'm probably not naming all the originators of it, but John was the one that got me started on it. The, the IntelliJs is on the edge of the network, and the network itself is just an efficient packet transmission network. So you don't, you don't care if you're sending a, 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 a music or a fax or an email. This, that analogy applies to the humanitarian development world. For example, what's happening in Africa, we have a smart center, dumb edge design for helping people in Africa, which has the effect of increasing their dependency on, on the process. Uh, so that people become more dependent on the uh, uh, agencies and the aid and things like that, and less able to be resilient on their own accord. And uh, you couple that with what's going on with AIDS and the, the other political chaos, and it's a, it's a real mess. So um, center model and the, the VLSU model, if you want to call it that, is a smart edges model. So you have smarter, smarter edges of people who are connected um, in their better world opportunities. And the network is just this thin transmission medium connecting people and managing the reputation. So the network itself is not where the intelligence lies. It, it's, it's pushed outward. So um, you know, there's a lot of uh, knowledge banks that you see running around on the, on the network, uh, World Bank or whatever. You know. But these knowledge banks are really this centralized smart center uh, model of, of well, let's put this knowledge over here in this corner. The, the actual deployment of the knowledge in working groups, and this comes from the community of practice uh, model of, of organizational learning, if you want to call it that, is the, the knowledge is in the doing and the communities who are doing the, the, uh, uh, the work. So pushing that outward, uh, outbound, uh, to the edges of the network and conceiving of a network that is this uh, connecting space. So. <coughs> Um, is, 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 I think, critical. And so, again, it comes back to creating this space, even as small as it, it doesn't have to be a big space, but it has to be scalable. It has to be capable of getting larger and getting more and more people involved uh, is, is the key thing. So uh, another analogy I use is the conversion from uh, the mini computer era to the microcomputer era. So the mini computers in the 70s and 80s were vertically integrated. So digital, Hewlett Packard, Wang, Prime, Tandem, whatever, had their own operating systems, hardware, disk drives, you know, vertically integrated. And you bought the whole package. You couldn't use the digital operating system on a Tandem machine. The mini computer era came along, and you had these layers. So the Intel did the microcomputers. Microsoft did the software. Uh, Seagate did the disk drives. So you had this kind of a stack, a protocol stack, if you will, of, of the computer industry, and people could focus on what part of the industry they uh, want to work on. Uh, philanthropy or humanitarian world today is the stovepipe model. It's the, the mini computer era of, of 1.4 million nonprofits in the United States alone, 275,000 NGOs working in Brazil. All of these have an executive director, or should have a financial officer, have the whole stack of op activities that they need to go through. So today, if you wanted to go do something on any scale, you need to start a nonprofit and go through the whole thing. And then people talk about uh, capacity building. We don't have enough management capacity to manage all this. Well, the, do we need 1.4 million CFOs, you know, 1.4 million uh, executive directors? Or is there an alternative way to structure this so you have this layered approach? So you'd have an infrastructure model where people could, could focus on their layer of, of whatever they want to do. So of particular interest to me is this people who have this do something instinct. We saw this after 9-11, after Katrina, after the tsunami. People want to do something. They have a very strong motivation to go out and do something in response to seeing something terrible happening. So if you give them a uh, a layer in this protocol stack, and if you organize philanthropy or humanitarian work as, as a microcomputer model rather than a mini computer model, uh, they could go there and they could they could say, "Hey, I want to I want to send books to Jamaica." So, bam, connect with somebody over there, and they're they're sending books to Jamaica and feeling like they've accomplished something. Uh, the current model is, well, we'll just send money to the Red Cross and presume that they're going to do something good with it. Uh, but they, you don't get the same. I'll we'll call it transformational energy back. You know, I didn't really help those kids in Jamaica by sending money to the Red Cross. I helped the Red Cross. And so, but if you have a greater connection and you have this greater sense of participation and, and feedback and this sense of, wow, I really did help somebody, 
uh, that would fuel itself. You wouldn't have people calling you at dinner time saying, please send more money, you say, geez. So for, you know, for 50 cents, you can uh, you know, save a baby's life through an oral rehydration solution. Well, if you could save a baby's life with 50 cents, you'd, you'd probably want to spend a dollar next time. You know? uh, a two cents vitamin A tablet will restore blindness, uh, sight from a blindness kit in South Asia. So it's amazingly tiny things could have huge effects. And if you gave a dollar and you had 50 kids who could see because of your dollar and they thanked you for it, you wouldn't have the same uh, uh, dynamics that we have today about the fundraising thing. Uh, this also allows for greater diversity. And one of the things you notice is you have um, fad philanthropy. You know, the tsunami hits and suddenly everybody's sending money to the tsunami and uh, hurricane. Now we're in a hurricane. Uh, Niger was hot on the, the, the top 40 list or top 10 list before the hurricane. Kids are starving in uh, Niger, and you know we've kind of lost track of that because of the New Orleans situation. There's a whole lot of need and suffering out there that is continuous and below the, the radar screen of the media. So what we see right now is we're just paying attention to the most mediagenic misery on the TV set, and whatever's hot gets all the money. Uh, whether they need it all or not is another issue, uh, or whether they need it in one spike or one continuous stream over 10 years. So we don't have a way of diffusing the spotlight effect, I call it. Uh, so we have this mass media model of, of putting all of our attention on one thing, and that kind of is the one, the one uh, you know, uh, fad of the moment. But I think we need a, a stronger uh, diffusion model of, of taking uh, the, this energy and attention and diffusing it over a much broader area. Uh, HIV AIDS, for example, is a huge problem, but it's just kind of in the background. It's in, it's in the noise level, and you know, one starving kid someplace gets the attention. Um, but um, something that's kind of chronic and huge and too big for a sound bite uh, just can't make it to the, uh, to the spotlight. So um, that's, that's one of the problems that I think we need to resolve on the network effect. So what's this, that's the paying attention tool, which I understand is an artificial intelligence problem of what does the program pay attention to. And I, I resolve that in my mind, at least, my current level of thinking through uh, intense feedback. And one of the lessons I saw yesterday on the sessions was somebody saying that the optic nerves leading from the brain to the eye were 10 times the capacity from the eye to the brain, saying that the brain was actively conditioning the neural network to, to seize things. So if you see ink blobs, they're going to turn into a face because the brain is looking for a face. But the brain is a very active participant in the vision process. It's just not a, a, a CCD, you know, uh, retina putting it back into a, a computer someplace. So the, the, the role of feedback and reputation and understanding of what's happening on the other side of the network, if you will, uh, is really key. And um, this is another scale phenomenon. Uh, how do you scale that up? Um, the eBay reputation model of intentionally tagging things and putting uh, uh, reputation points on it, if you will, uh, I'm not sure is, is scalable, uh, exponentially scalable, say the G, uh, Google uh, model of, of scanning the haystack and looking for what it wants to find. So there has to be some combination of the intentional tagging that, that eBay uses and the inferential model, that statistical uh, model that Google is using. Um, I don't know the balance there. Maybe it's a combination of the two. And there might also be an editorial role of, of, of people analyzing what's happening and kind of synthesizing it uh, intentionally through uh, committees or standards bodies or uh, one of the things I played with is uh, pattern languages. Uh, Richard Gabriel wrote in a book on pattern languages and writers workshops. Uh, comes from the work of Christopher Alexander, uh, the architect, and talked about patterns of architecture and what gives vitality to a space. So this room, for example, has windows on two sides. It's a common pattern of Alexander. If we were in a room with only one-sided windows, uh, we kind of look cave-like and be kind of depressing. So being in a corner with two, two windows is uh, a nice pattern. So are there patterns of uplift that we can detect? Are there these the kind of abstracted knowledge that you can frame in uh, a pattern saying the, 
dependency is, uh, well, autonomy is, would be the pattern I want to talk about, but um, the notion of uh, a pattern language is abstracted from all these activities. And so what is working? How do you do more of it? The, so micro loans are a, a pattern, if you will, that is caught a lot of attention uh, and it is, is rapidly growing, uh, giving loans to uh, poor women in villages that are cross-collateralized uh, by, say, six women who then are all responsible for each other's uh, success. So that's a very successful pattern, if you will. Are there other uh, patterns that we could abstract? So you have a, a kind of a pattern language that would be manually uh, abstracted from uh, uh, the activities. So that's this editorial uh, role that would be beyond what a, a, an eBay or a Google type approach would do for it. So have I exhausted the uh, tape yet? I haven't worn out your your tape, huh? I think, yeah, I think you've covered everything that I needed. Okay. Yeah, very good. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's nice to have an opportunity to talk. I, I, uh, um, I have one more extension to Toasters and Cats. Would you want to hear that? Or Yeah. It's actually a book that I'm writing, uh, Toasters, Cats, and Snowflakes. So the extension, the, the toaster is something that's built, cats are something that are grown, a snowflake is something that happens when the environment is right um, by lowering the temperature. So less energy in the atmosphere, you get more uh, order and more diversity in the snowflakes than the higher temperature, which is really kind of profound. Uh, you know, the, you, you've got these water molecules up there, and you lower the temperature, and you have order in snow and snowflakes. And you look at the snowflakes, and you have greater diversity. So that, I call that the... Uh, condensation. So toasters are built, cats are grown, and snowflakes condense. And this notion of creating an environment within which the um, good things will condense is, is really kind of an amazing process. And uh, the web, in a sense, condensed from the initial conditions. And he created the, uh, the, the, the space within which it fueled itself. And the more fuel it got, the bigger it got to fuel more people. So this condensing a virtuous circle in a space um, is, is a very interesting model for global transformation, if you will. Uh, how do you make the world a better place? By You create the conditions, you create the environment, and then you let things happen. Um, and you don't need to know exactly what they're going to be, but you need to know that it, what happens is going to be self-evidently the right thing. So uh, this notion of a, of, uh, a snowflake or a snowstorm as a model of global transformation is very intriguing. And I think we've seen it happen with the web. We've seen Google come from nowhere to become a global phenomenon, uh, eBay, uh, Amazon. Um, and there's a lot of these, these things that have happened recently the, of companies that maybe they knew about it, maybe they run the lottery, but um, they, they exploited the network effect to their uh, benefit. Um, I, I think that there's tremendous potential in getting smart people to think this thing through for a better world effect. And the, the kind of intelligence that's being applied to you know, the dot-com frenzy or and the resurgence of it or whatever uh, could be applied to the better world stuff. It may not be a profitable activity. I, I'm in a position where I retired and I'm self-funded, so I don't, I don't need to derive income from what I'm doing. So I'm free to, to think of systems without uh, the profit motive. I'm not against profit by any means, but there are uh, probably many things that we need to do that are not driven by uh, financial reward, but rather the self-interest, which I do think is necessary for a successful system, could be done through this personal sense of transformation, of, of helping. The same energy you see coming out of the hurricane of, of people wanting to help and do things. It's a very natural, normal human reaction and that's it's, it's a to me that's what's worth worthy of amplification so that maybe better world amplification instead of intelligence amplification uh, not all intelligence is uh, better worldly um, but the um, the snowflake model is uh, I think probably the most uh, fertile area to look at uh, of creating this environment within which the good stuff will condense Trust and reputation, as I said, is a key part of it. Creating the space or the environment uh, with this autocatalytic property of, of 
you know, kind of fostering the virtuous circle is another aspect to it. Uh, creating the boundaries, the, the constraints, the edges of this network. Um, and this may not be favored by the big players in the industry uh, in the same way as Ma Bell didn't like the internet coming along and doing the smart edges. Um, the organizations that are thriving in the current model of fundraising and uh, the, the hierarchical control structures probably are not going to be happy with this you know, disruptive technology that's coming up from the grassroots that is bypassing their their wisdom and knowledge and you're giving your money to those little garage shops instead of the, the big entities. So this isn't an idea that would be fueled through the, 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 the industry. It would be a, probably seen as somewhat subversive or disruptive if, if they even see it. I think one of the benefits that Tim had is that the big guys didn't even see his work. You know, he, he didn't have to worry about competing with AOL or CompuServe. You know, he was ridiculously underpowered for that. He just created his vision, <coughs> made it work, and let the network, network dynamics uh, come along. And AOL had to follow his lead. Well, it was no longer his lead by that, that time, of course. And it wasn't Tim's web, by the way. It was the World Wide Web. So it was a gift. Uh, he, he, he gave this technology uh, to, to the world, if you will. Uh, and uh, he took a very strong leadership role in the, the early days, but once it, once it took off, it, it, it took off on its own, and he, he wasn't one of the dot-commer uh, uh, boom, boom or bust type characters. He just kind of kept his eyes focused on the, the dynamics of the, the, of, the, of the web, and eventually it took off without him, which is a sign of a, a good visionary, I guess. So I have a lot of respect for what Tim Berners-Lee did with the web and, and how he operationalized his vision and followed it through. So that's the snowflake story. So, okay, so, uh, great, that's a good opportunity.